the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, Master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. Well, we're going to start preparing the 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And we're going to do it, as we have been doing, uh, by spending the first 15 minutes reflecting on this document, Verbum Domini. I want to thank the people who have written or emailed in that they find, telling me that they find this helpful. So I'm happy to go on with it, because it's a very exciting document, and it gets more exciting as time goes on. But we do have, in this number 16 for today, something very interesting. Conscious of this pneumatological horizon, the Holy Spirit horizon, the Senate Fathers highlighted the importance of the Holy Spirit's work in the life of the Church and in the hearts of believers in relation to Holy Scripture. You see, it's a dead letter without the Holy Spirit. And we can have great and important scientific historical knowledge about the text, which is very important. But that gives us, now we have a conversation partner. We know what the other partner in the conversation is saying. But we have to know now what the significance of what they're saying is. And so, uh, this text goes on, see, the life of the church and the hearts of believers in relation to sacred scripture, without the efficacious working of the spirit of truth, the words of the Lord cannot be understood. They're dead without the life of the spirit. You see, uh, it's the spirit that gives life. And so we pray when we pick up the sacred text, you know, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So this is a quote now from St. Irenaeus. Those who do not share in the Spirit do not draw from the bosom of their mother, the Church, the food of life. They don't suck at the breasts of Mother Church, you see. Um, they receive nothing from the purest fountain that flows from the body of Christ. That pure fountain is the Word of God. Now the Pope goes on, just as the Word of God comes to us in the body of Christ, in his Eucharistic body, and in the body of the Scriptures, through the working of the Holy Spirit, so too it can be truly received and understood uh, only through that same Spirit. This is so important, because we can do the work we have to do to establish a bond between ourselves and the text in its final edited canonical form, but understanding the levels behind that. But when we've done that, it's like I finally got a Chinese man on the phone. I'm ready to talk to him. I can hear his voice. I know he's speaking Chinese. But if I don't know Chinese, I have no idea what he's saying. So all the historical work, which is like picking up the phone, you need it to make the contact. But after I've made the contact, if I don't know what John is talking about, I'll never understand it. That's the challenge, okay? Um, and so, the great writers of the Christian tradition speak unanimously of the place of the Holy Spirit in the relationship which believers are, have, are, ha are to have with the Scriptures. St. John Chrysostom states that, quote, Scripture needs the revelation of the Spirit so that by discovering the true meaning of the things enclosed therein, we can reap, reap abundant benefits. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, writing a text uh, on St. Bonaventure, says you've got to understand that revelation, this is Bonaventure, 
agreed to by Ratzinger and by me and lots of other people. Revelation is not in the text. It's in the understanding of the text. You've got to get it before it's revelation. That's Bonaventure. Okay? Um, St. Jerome is likewise convinced. The Pope's quoting some of the great commentators of antiquity. Huh? We cannot come to an understanding of Scripture without the assistance of the Holy Spirit who inspired it. That makes sense, right? If you can talk to the author of a book, you're going to have a much greater idea of what he's saying, right? You just say, Holy Spirit, you're talking through Jeremiah or John or Paul or James. What are you saying? Okay. St. Gregory the Great nicely emphasizes the work of the Spirit in the formation and interpretation of the Bible. This is a quote now from St. Gregory. He himself created the words of the Holy Testament. He himself revealed their meaning. And then Richard of St. Victor, who's slightly later, well, about four centuries, five centuries later, Richard of St. Victor points out that, quote, we need the eyes of doves, enlightened and taught by the Spirit in order to understand the sacred text. What are the eyes of doves? He's referring to the inside of the Holy Spirit as a dove. We need to look with the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a famous story about St. Jerome, who's a saint. He was did a lot of his work in a cave. And you know, once in a while, he was working, commenting on Paul. He'd pick up the manuscript and he'd throw it across the cave and say, St. Paul, you don't want to be understood. And then he'd go back to work. We have to do that, huh? All right, here too, I would like to emphasize the very significant witness to the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Scripture, which we find in the texts of the liturgy. For the Word of God is proclaimed, heard, and explained to the faithful. And we have so many texts. First, we have the, the text itself. In the Dei Verba number 21, the, the Church gives the same reverence and honor to the sacred scripture as she does to the Eucharist. That's right in the text. Uh, now, uh, this is what the Pope says. For the word of God is proclaimed, heard, and explained to the faithful. We find a witness to this in the ancient prayers, which in the form of an epiclesis invoke the Spirit before the proclamation of the readings. This is a text now uh, from the Serapian Liturgicon. Send your paraclete spirit into our hearts and make us understand the scriptures which he has inspired and grant, this is the priest praying, that I may worthily interpret them so that the faithful assembly here may profit by, the, by, by them. There's a prayer that the priest can bow over and say before he reads the gospel. I always say it in Latin. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, as you cleanse the lips of your prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. So deign to cleanse me that I may worthily proclaim your gospel. That's a prayer the priest can say. I say it every day. Um, praying Purify me. How can I handle your word if I'm not purified? You know, you just, you know, read the text and then tell them about my hunting trip. I mean, okay. God our Savior, this is another one. We implore you for this people. Send upon them the Holy Spirit. May the, may the Lord Jesus come to visit them, speak to the minds of all, dispose their hearts to faith, and lead our souls to you, God of mercy. And that's another, that's part of the same Serapian text. Huh? But you see, it's like an epiclesis, an epiclesis. We call down the Holy Spirit so that the bread and wine, now the body and blood of Christ, will be powerful and bless the whole church. You see? Well, we do the same with the Word. Let this Word bless your whole church. Okay? Uh, this makes it clear 
these texts. That we cannot come to understand the meaning of the word unless we are open to the working of the paraclete in the church and in the hearts of believers. That's why before we read the gospel or preach, we should have our own form of epiclesis, calling down the Holy Spirit on ourselves. That prayer that I gave, which is right in the Missal, but on the people too, Lord, take away their worries, their distractions, their resistance, and let them hear your word. You see how intimately the word is tied with the scriptures. Now, the Pope moves on, moves on now to talk about tradition. In reaffirming the profound connection between the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, we have also laid the basis for an understanding of the significance and the decisive value of the living tradition and the sacred scriptures in the Church. See, the tradition is the context. In fact, when the, in the early Vatican II there was a big debate about one source or two sources of uh, revelation. Two source theory was there's scripture and tradition. The one source theory is there's tradition. And the inspired expression of tradition is the scriptures. You see, it's a living reality. Suppose we are in a town and you know the town and I don't. And somebody says, I'll meet you on the corner of 14th and 5th. You know right away what that means because you know the town. It's just numbers to me. Tradition is you knowing the lay of the land. So you have a place, an understanding, a way to understand what's being said. Now that you can acquire greater familiarity with that first by a life of prayer and praying over the scriptures. But then to reading the great saints who have come in it on the scriptures, you see. Um, indeed, since God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, the divine word spoken in time is bestowed and consigned to the church in a definitive way so that the proclamation of salvation can be communicated effectively in every time and place. In one of his studies, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote that there is one interpreting subject of the scriptures. It's the church, the whole body of Christ. You remember how Dei Verbum, Dei Verbum what, 8 says, you see, that um, the apostolic preaching develops uh, first by the prayer and contemplation of the faithful, number one. Number two, by the intimate knowledge that they gain of these realities by experience, two. And three, by the preaching of those who have been endowed with the charism of truth with the Episcopal office. Now, that doesn't mean the bishops can start with number three. They have to do number one and two as well. They have to have a prayer life. They have to be pondering the scriptures, being enlightened by it. And then, when they confirm that, uh, it brings life to the church. So, we'll stop there and pick up next time in number 17 on this whole notion of tradition in the church.